Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Millie Hawk Daniel, Vice President for Communications at PolicyLink. In today's All In Nation webinar, the topic is com communicating about race, equity, and the economy. This webinar is the fifth in a series built around the new book, All In Nation, An America That Works for All. PolicyLink co-edited the book with the Center for American Progress. It features essays, data, and analysis, and it also offers a policy agenda for realizing an America that truly does work for everyone. Contributors to the book Contributors to the book include Ajahn Poo, Michelle Alexander, Marion Wright Edelman, Robert Lynch, and other leaders from the worlds of academ academia, policy advocacy, and economics. If you haven't already, I hope you'll download the book at www.allinnation.org, and that's all in nation, one word. The members of today's panel are distinguished leaders in the world of communications and all focus on race, opportunity, and equity. Each brings years of experience in thinking about the role of communications in advancing a policy agenda. I'm very pleased to introduce – whoops, the slides got ahead of me. Very pleased to introduce Vanessa Cardenas, who is Vice President of Progress 2050 at the Center for American Progress. Alan Jenkins, who is the Executive Director of the Opportunity Agenda. And Renku Sen, President and Executive Director of Applied Research Center and publisher of ColorLines.com. We know the demographics of the United States are changing. Over the next three decades, the pe people of color will be in the majority in the country. This is a real opportunity to achieve fair and just inclusion into a society in which all can participate and prosper. That's the description of equity. We've invited our panel today to talk about how we frame the conversation about equity, race, opportunity, and economics. Language, images, messages, and data are tools. Using those tools strategically to communicate with a variety of audiences are the techniques we can learn, practice, refine, and master. Tools and techniques will help us communicate about America's tomorrow, where equity is the superior growth model. In just a moment, I'm going to start the conversation with Vanessa, who will give us an overview of All In Nation and how it relates to thinking about a communication strategy. First, though, here are a few housekeeping details. Vanessa is only able to be with us for 30 minutes. If you have questions for her or for any of the panelists, you should type them into the chat box, but we'll try to specifically get to the ones for Vanessa before she has to leave. After the webinar, we'll send you a copy of the presentation and a link to the webinar archive. So if there are facts and data that you hear or see, please know you'll get to see it on your own after the webinar ends. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Vanessa to talk about All In Nation, the book, and the, and the information. Great. Thank you so much, Millie. And first of all, I want to thank PolicyLink for organizing uh, these webinars. Uh, for us, it's been a great experience to partner with them um, in the writing and editing of this book, uh, All In Nation. As Millie said, my name is Vanessa Cárdenas, and I work at the Center for American Progress. I oversee a project called Progress 2050. Uh, we started this project about uh, three years ago, and uh, when we started it out, it was right after the uh, 2010 census, and back then, the projection said that by the year 2042, uh, the majority of people in the United States were going to be people of color. Then it went back to, like, later because of the economy. Now it's back to 2043. So we decided um, to say 2050 because we knew that by 2050 was going to happen. So that's why um, the name sort of stuck with us, so it's Progress 2050. And I'm excited to uh, join in this call today with Rinku and Alan, two people that have done so much work around communications and communicating about race um, that um, it's really an honor for me to uh, be in this panel with them. 
But as Millie said, I wanted to just sort of share a little bit with you sort of our approach in writing this book uh, because we actually did uh, think a little bit uh, about how we wanted to communicate about the pending demographics and how to connect that to the broader conversation about equity and economy in our nation. And um, one of the first things that we did when we started um, with the concept of this book was to think about the audience, you know, who our audience is for this book. And our audience, uh, defining our audience was very important. Uh, obviously, we wanted this to be aimed at electeds at the federal level because the policy prescriptions that we wanted to outline were federal in nature. We also wanted um, to make sure that this book was helpful to activists, so we wanted to have a lot of data and facts um, that would arm activists to talk about the demographic change, but also to talk about the different issue areas. And of course, we also wanted uh, this book to be helpful to administration officials, so we wanted to make sure we have voices that connected with people that work at the different agencies. We wanted to give them lots of facts and very specific ideas on how they could do their part to move an equity agenda forward. Um, so that was the, sort of the first thing we defined. And next, you know, given the fact that I have a little bit of a communications background, I worked on immigration before um, at the National Immigration Forum, and before my current role, I was also doing some work around immigration. So I sort of thought back about the way we talk about immig immigration reform. And um, some of the key, if you guys are familiar with the message box, you know, we always talk about, you know, values. Um, define the, the problem of the situation, talk about solutions, and also talk about what's in it for, for, for us, what's in it for the person that you are communicating to. So when you actually look at the book, you, you'll see that we sort of try to stick to sort of that message box frame. And we started out the book um, talking about our values, about who we are as a nation and what unites us as Americans in thinking about this demographic change. We also talked about our commitment to justice and fairness, regardless of who we are. So in this chapter, we really wanted to sort of assuage those fears that people might have about the demographic change and really focus on, you know, what unites us as Americans, that regardless of where you come from or what color your skin is, we all are here because we believe in the American dream. And we also wanted to remind Americans that the American dream didn't just happen. We built it, and we built it by creating and passing policies that created this latter opportunity. And But also reminding folks that in the past, we've actually left people out of that American dream, and we have an opportunity today, knowing what the future brings, that we can reinvest in that ladder of opportunity by, by again, being bold and being forward-looking and creating the ladder of opportunity. I know that right now this might sound a little out of, you know, connected because of what's happening in Congress, but, again, we were talking here about vision and values, so we wanted to sort of start out with a very positive framework. So that's what we did on the first chapter. We also spent, in the first chapter, we also spent a little bit of time defining the situation of the demographic change. And I'm saying situation because normally in a message box we talk about the challenge, but we definitely didn't want to talk about diversity in a challenge, as a challenge, but mostly as an opportunity that we needed to take advantage of. And we spent some time talking about why diversity is good for the United States, that it's not just about food, for sure, it's, 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 a, it's more about innovation, about entrepreneurship, about human capital. So we reminded in the book, in the first chapter, we talked about how innovation drives businesses, how it connects to the global economy. We talked about the fact that Latinos and African Americans start small businesses three times the rates of, non, of whites. So we sort of went to those very specific data points to remind folks that diversity it is it's an opportunity to be embraced and not a challenge at all, especially because, as you all know, a lot of the conversation about the demographic change or, or, or about our communities always focuses on the deficiencies or the challenges, which are important for the context, but it shouldn't, the conversation shouldn't end there. We should be talking about this sort of really um, all, the, all the opportunities and uh, innovation that diversity brings. And we also talked about human capital, that human capital is the greatest asset any economy could have. And we have human capital thanks in large part to these growing communities that are going to keep us innovative and cutting edge. 
then we moved, we moved on to sort of the second piece of the message box, which is, which is what's in it for me. And this is where we, uh, and I'm, I'm going to go through some slides in a second, but this is where we, t we went from the sort of the moral conversation, you know, the moral conversation in terms of, you know, this is what America is about. We have to do it because it's a, it's a moral need. But it's also an economic imperative, and, this is, and it is because it's, there's something in it for you. And that's when we talked about, uh, you know, what, what would happen if we actually were to create an all-in nation. And these slides will show you the economic analysis that we did. And all of these slides, um, you can actually find them at allinnation.org, and you can print them there, and the methodology is there. For those of you who like uh, to look at the, at, the, at the little letters explaining all of that, but here I go. So the next um, slide shows you what happens if we actually would have an all-in nation. That means if we were actually, what we did is we, we did an economic exercise that showed what would happen if we were actually be able to close the income of African American and Latinos to whites. And this was our way to sort of uh, put real numbers in, in how closing racial gaps would help us economically. And as you can see from the first slide, in income, if there will be, if we will close racial gaps, we would have 8.1% um, higher in income for for the different groups. The next slide is is about GDP. And if we were to close racial gaps in income, we would have more GDP, 1.2 trillion. The next slide shows you what would happen to poverty if we were actually close income racial gaps, and that shows you that we would have 13 million people would be lifted out of poverty. The next slide shows you what would happen to tax revenue, and if we were to be able to close racial gaps in income, we would have one, 192 billion more in tax revenue. And our final slide in terms of trying to make this economic argument is that our social security, the deficit will be reduced by 10 percent or 860 billion. So this was our attempt to create, to give an answer to that question, what's in it for me, um, to give specific data points for people so they could point of how closing racial gaps would benefit our economy um, overall, but also on a personal level when we talked about incomes. And then the third chapter of the book, if you go to allinnation.org, you can see it there, is we also talked about why it matters. And in that chapter, we actually commissioned it to Anthony Carnival, um, who is a uh, professor at Georgetown University, and he does a lot of work uh, around analyzing the educational needs of our future workforce. So what he did, he sort of wrote a chapter for us, and that chapter gives a lot of specific statistics on why it's hugely important to close uh, racial gaps because of our workforce needs. And for example, one of the stats that he outlines in his chapter is that by 2050, Hispanics and African Americans will make up 42% of the workforce. Today, they make up 27% of the workforce. So we, we, you see the growth of our communities in the workforce and how important it is to close the educational gaps that they face. Another statistic that um, he outlines in his chapter is the fact that um, in 2012, 59% of jobs required post-secondary education, yet only 38% of Latinos has temporary has post-secondary education, and 58% of African Americans has that level of education. Again, to really illustrate why it's imperative to close racial gaps, knowing where our economy is going in terms of jobs, as well as in population shifts. So I, I will stop there now because I really sort of just wanted to give you uh, the communications framework that we applied to our book. I hope that was helpful, and I'm sure that both Rinko and Alan will have a lot to say about that. Um, but I just hope that this is helpful to you all. You can find it on the website, allinnation.org. And we are also hopeful that in the next year or so, CAP will provide more analysis that's uh, more along the lines of the, making the economic argument, which we hope everyone will use as a tool moving forward. So I'll stop there and see if anyone has questions. And I apologize for having to jump off a little bit earlier. So thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, I wanted to make a comment, and then I want to ask uh, a question that someone just sent in mm -hmm. for you. Um, and the comment is, when I introduced this panel, I mentioned 
the, the importance of data as one of the many tools that we use in framing our communications messages. And certainly the kind of data that Vanessa has just shared with us is precisely the kind of uh, foundation that we can frequently use to, uh, to frame and then discuss the issues and the moral as well as the economic arguments. Um, so thank you for that. I have a question for you, uh, Vanessa. Um, is this information scaled down to specific geographic areas? The, the uh, writer would like to is interested in seeing the region where she lives or he lives. I'm not sure. Um, can you respond to that? Sure. We don't have the regional data right now, but I, I think that as we move forward in creating more of this analysis, that is something that we're going to look at. Um, and I mean, I think it would be hugely helpful to be able to provide that at the state level. I think that, for, you know, I, as I mentioned, I worked uh, with immigration before, and our immigration team has done a ton of work around the benefits of legalization, both at the, at the national and at the state level. So we might be able to use some of their economic modeling to do that. So that's something definitely on my to-do list for the next year or so. Great. Okay. Um, and then there's, I have another question that talks about framing. So I think I'd like to move on to Alan, um, keeping an eye on the clock um, for, for Vanessa's sake, uh, but then to um, have all of the panelists talk about the framing as we move into the discussion section of the webinar. So, Alan, I know that uh, Opportunity Agenda has recently launched a new communications toolkit that can help us think about framing and messaging the all-in nation. Will you tell us about it? I will. Thanks, Millie, and thanks so much to PolicyLink for including me in this webinar. I'm especially pleased to be participating because the Opportunity Agenda has this brand new uh, communications toolkit. It's literally hot off the presses, vision, values, and voice, which is designed to help uh, advocates, policymakers, researchers, faith leaders, business leaders, uh, and others speak more effectively about issues of opportunity and equity, including uh, racial equity. Uh, so the toolkit is available at uh, our website. Uh, you can find it directly at toolkit opportunityagenda.org, or you can just go to our website, which is opportunityagenda.org, to find it. Uh, and uh, I'll only spend a moment on this, but uh, we are also introducing our very own superhero uh, to uh, take viewers through the toolkit, Helvetica Bold. We say her words are mightier than a sword. Uh, and we really picked uh, Helvetica, commissioned her from artist Gan Golan and uh, Betsy Richards on our staff, because we really view uh, the folks on the call as superheroes, very unsung, and anything we can do to support you all uh, in your communications, we would like to do. And so you'll, when you have a chance to look at the, uh, the toolkit, you'll see that Helvetica's origin is she starts out as an advocate like many of us on the call. Something happens to her. You'll have to read the graphic novel in order to, to see what, and she becomes a powerful communicator. So I'm hopeful that uh, that will be part of what you get from the toolkit. And as I say, it speaks to a lot of the issues in All in Nation. And so I'm especially pleased to be able to talk about the two together. Uh, as many of you know, we're often up against uh, a mindset. Uh, there's questions I saw about economic arguments uh, that uh, are the folks who are often our opponents on these issues make. And so the, the arguments are familiar, and they're here on the slide. Opportunity is equal now. We're a post-racial nation. We often hear discussing race is divisive. It's racist itself to even discuss uh, race or racial equity. It's a crutch. Uh, government and institutions can't and should not regulate equal opportunity or even the economy, uh, and we often hear this drumbeat that the answer is personal responsibility and the free market, that if there's inequality, then it's, it's the fault of people who have less in our society. And so the, the toolkit and uh, the brief presentation I'm going to do today are really about how we can begin to answer uh, both answer some of those critiques, but also affirmatively tell our own story. And it relates to understanding our audiences, leading with shared values, telling systemic stories, and I'll describe what that means, over-documenting barriers to equity and equal opportunity, uh, using a contribution model, and emphasizing solutions. And uh, VPSA is a tool that uh, is introduced in the toolkit. 
Uh, so understanding our audiences, this is really a, a strategic matter of uh, really being able to glean uh, our, the audience that we're addressing. Are they uh, are based? Do they already agree with us, who we consider to be ones and twos on this scale? Are, are they, in other words, people who we simply want to motivate and get them to take action, uh, but who we don't have to persuade? Or are they on the fence? Are they threes and fours, uh, meaning are they persuadable but not yet in our camp? Uh, or are they the opposition, where we should not be uh, exerting communications resources to convince them because they're, by their nature, not persuadable on our issues, and probably all of us on this call are fives to some people. Uh, we're not going to be persuaded on some issues, but we do need to neutralize their effect on persuading the threes and fours uh, and sometimes the twos. And so that's really a matter of strategy, but it means that we have to develop a narrative that spans all of those audiences, that mobilizes the base, persuades the persuadables, and marginalizes the opposition. Uh, one of the ways that we recommend doing that is leading with values, and you heard Vanessa talk a bit about that. Uh, often those of us in policy and research land like to lead with policies, uh, Secure Communities Program, the CRA, Community Reinvestment Act. Often our audiences aren't familiar with the details. They're not engaged. They're not interested. Uh, they don't uh, have an entry point. Uh, the next level up is issues, immigration, affordable housing, civil rights. Uh, most audiences and persuadables know what those issues are, but they come to the conversation with their own preconceptions. So you say civil rights to some folks, and they're thinking either of uh, something that they believe ended in the 50s and 60s. Uh, they may be thinking of a particular leader who they admire or uh, who they uh, don't admire. Uh, same with, with education, poverty. We recommend 90% of the time leading with values, uh, the, the notion of opportunity, of equity, fairness, community, the idea that we're all in it together. These are entry points for audiences that are persuadable and also that mobilize our base because, after all, that's why the base is in it, because of the values that they believe in. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of some of the values that we utilize at the Opportunity Agenda, uh, and we lead, not surprisingly, with the notion of opportunity, that everyone should have a fair chance to achieve his or her full potential. Uh, and that ensuring that fair chance requires many of these other values. Uh, I won't dwell on that, but it's important for you to figure out what are the values that you share with your target audiences and what are the, the connections that can be made to the issues of equity that you're pursuing. Uh, sometimes we have the benefit of opinion research to do that. Sometimes it's really a matter of listening and participating with our audiences. Uh, next is telling an episodic uh, pardon me, telling a systemic or thematic story rather than episodic. So that's a wonky uh, way of saying we need to explain why many of the challenges that we're facing uh, in pursuing an all-in nation and pursuing a more equitable and, and successful society are systemic and they require uh, broad policy solutions as well as changes in behavior. We used here the example of uh, racial profiling, which for many decades was something we couldn't get traction on in the civil rights community because people viewed it as simply the, the single rogue racist police officer, but not a systemic practice. And through, so through a lot of very effective storytelling and documentation uh, through the media, the notion of driving while black, driving while black and brown, and then ultimately racial profiling emerged in the public's mind, something that is a systemic policy solution Simply uh, changing the behavior of one police officer won't address the problem. And so it's very important for us to be telling stories that have uh, human stories embedded in them but really are about systemic or, or thematic problems and broad policy solutions. Next is over-documenting barriers to equal opportunity. And, you know, I can just say here that whatever amount of uh, research and data and information you think is necessary to persuade most audiences that uh, there are issues of, of unequal opportunity that need addressing, you can quadruple it. Uh, we're, we're astounded by the extent to which many, many audiences, including many people of color, will work very hard to find some other explanation uh, for inequality and often to blame uh, people who uh, have the least. So here we have an example of 
something that uh, we often say, and it's important to say in the uh, fair lending context, subprime loans are five times more likely in black neighborhoods than in white neighborhoods. We find that that's necessary but not sufficient, that audiences, especially persuadable audiences, will struggle hard to fi figure out and even to, to surmise ways, reasons that uh, African Americans in this example are more likely to get subprime loans. Well, their credit was worse, they made bad choices, et cetera. Uh, those are unspoken but often going on in people's heads. Uh, and so we have an additional paragraph here. Uh, in, uh, subprime loans are five times more likely in uh, black neighborhoods than in white neighborhoods, controlling for income and credit worthiness. And homeowners in high-income black communities are twice as likely as homeowners in low-income white areas to be given subprime loans. Now, that's all factually true, but it, it also begins to take away some of the excuses that people have in their minds and to talk about unequal barriers, not just unequal outcomes. Uh, the next piece of advice that you'll find in the toolkit is related to that uh, and something that I thought uh, Vanessa did beautifully and that the All In Nation book does very well and gives us a lot of ammunition for, uh, which is to use not just a deficit model but a contribution model. So you see the original paragraph about uh, unequal barriers and outcomes, but also a contribution paragraph. By ensuring access to fair credit on fair terms, we can save thousands of homes, prevent thousands of bankruptcies, and help our economy get going again. So in other words, not just uh, what we're doing wrong or where there are uh, deficiencies, but why solving the problem matters and why it matters for all of us. Uh, and one of the great things about All In Nation is that it gets into very specific data-based evidence for what the contribution would be of addressing some of these uh, barriers. Uh, next is promoting positive solutions, not just problems. Some of you have heard me say before that there's a reason why Martin Luther King Jr.'s greatest speech was not called, I have a complaint. Uh, but often we forget that. Uh, and we, we're much better typically at talking about what's wrong than what we're for. Uh, and that is a problem because often people are tired uh, of hearing about problems. Even if it's something they care about, if they don't see a solution, it's very difficult emotionally for even sympathetic audiences to wrap their minds around taking action. Uh, there need to be, we need to be promoting solutions. There needs to be an intuitive connection between the, the values at stake, the problem that we've described, and the solution that we're promoting. Uh, and if that doesn't feel intuitive, we need to find new ways to talk about it. Uh, and then finally, building a message. Uh, this is something that you'll find at uh, page 20 of, of our uh, printed toolkit, and it's available online. Uh, and this is the, the uh, tool that we're offering, which is called VPSA, or Value Problem Solution Action. Lots of research, public opinion research, message testing, also our own experience in the field, shows that this is a particularly important way for communicating uh, to persuadable audiences especially, but also to uh, mo mobilize our base. And it's something that can be retrofitted for uh, an op-ed, for a speech, for a quick sound bite uh, in a media interview, uh, value problem solution action. So here you have that set out uh, in a way that we hope you'll find useful. This is taken directly from a set of flashcards at the back of our toolkit. Uh, and we also have examples in a lot of different contexts, economic justice and racial equity, uh, immigration, uh, housing, and uh, fair lending, and a number of, of other places. So we hope you'll use the uh, VPSA cards that we've provided, but also create your own. And one of the great things about the online version of the toolkit is that there, it's interactive. And so you can actually go in, create your own uh, VPSA cards, create your own messaging. You can share it with others. You can save it and print it out. And so we're very interested in hearing from all of you about what you're trying out, what's working, and the like, and promoting greater equity. Uh, finally, just a, a reminder of where you can find the toolkit. And also, we hope you'll uh, follow us on Twitter. There's going to be a lot more information coming from uh, us at the Opportunity Agenda, both messaging and opinion research and uh, media analysis. So please do check us out. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, please do, those of you who uh, already have the toolkit and those of you who will get it, uh, you know, definitely review it uh, alongside All In Nation because they, they fit together beautifully. There's a, a, just a wealth of data 
and storytelling uh, and positive solutions in All In Nation that give content and substance to the communications strategy that we're recommending. Uh, so I'm going to stop there, and thanks so much for being part of this webinar. Thank you, Alan. That was wonderful. And as you noted, it is so connected to uh, how we frame, how we message, how we use communications tools and strategies to advance an agenda. Um, I am getting a lot of questions, and so I just want people to know that. Please feel free to uh, type in your questions to the chat box as we uh, be, uh, turn this over now to Renku Sen. Alan talked about values and stories and uh, the data that uh, Vanessa has supplied as a good platform for those value, for those for conveying the values through the storytelling. I want to ask Renku to talk about the, the importance of storytelling as a communications tool in talking about race, equity, and the economy. Renku? Great. Thank you so much, Millie and uh, Vanessa and Alan. It's, it's really exciting to be on this webinar with all of you. I just want to start by um, summarizing the problems with the current race debate and the current race and economics debate that we're having in the country. Um, so the first real problem with regard to race is that Americans define it uh, wrong and that most Americans think of racial discrimination as always being intentional, individual, and overt. So if there isn't a noose hanging and if an individual person hasn't hung it, then m many Americans will think that means that there is no racism here. But we know, of course, in the ways that um, Alan has described, that much racism is actually systemic, unconscious, and hidden. And it's very difficult for um, Americans to identify that kind of discrimination, the systemic, unconscious, and hidden kind, yet that is the that is the majority of the discrimination that uh, communities of color suffer from. The second big problem in our debate is that there are a number of codes used in uh, in the media and in the press and by politicians that characterize people of color as perpetrators of one harm or another rather than as victims of systemic discrimination. This is a characterization that's used particularly terribly in public benefits debates uh, and also, I think, in jobs and immigration debates. So uh, from a couple of years ago, I remember very clearly Representative Steve King, who is one of the leading conservatives in Congress, uh, when during the debate on whether or not to expand the state children's health insurance program, Steve King created a new acronym for that program. His acronym was Socialist Clinton-esque Hillary Care for Illegals and Their Parents. And obviously nowhere in there does he say this is a program for uh, Latino immigrant children and their families, but uh, that is clearly what he means by illegals and their parents. So these are the kinds of codes that appear to be race neutral, but are really um, really feeding a discriminatory system and that uh, – we have to address in the debate from the ang from the racial equity and opportunity equity angles that we we want to move forward and then finally the third problem from my perspective is that even if people recognize that racial discrimination is still a problem in the country, they're really fatalistic about it. They don't really think that anything can change, and um, Alan has already spoken about that a lot, um, so I won't go further, but just want to reinforce that that kind of fatalism prevents us from having the kinds of policy debates that can actually address racial disparities. So I'm going to present now three of our 
uh, tips that are built out of our experience in changing race debates. And I'm going to use the example of our Drop the I Word campaign. That is a campaign that we have been doing for three years to get individuals and politicians and news outlets to drop the language of illegality in referring to undocumented immigrants. So my first tip here is that we have to be explicit about our racial justice commitments and about who we are committed to. It's really important not to use proxies like underserved or inner city. A colleague of mine told me a story recently where she said that um, inner city doesn't even work as a code anymore for talking about black and Latino communities because that's not who's in the inner city. The inner city has often been taken over by gentrification and it's really wealthy white people who live closest to the to the inner city. So when um, she was with a teenage relative listening to a news report that kept talking about the inner city, her the teenager said, "Well, who do they mean? Rich white people because that's that's who lives in the inner city." So we don't want to use proxies and codes. We want to use plain language and um, really name the communities we're talking about. And we can be we can be more comfortable in our explicitness if we focus on the impact of systems on communities of color rather than on racist intention. That that focus on impact rather than on intention can help us connect individual experience to the rules and the policies and practices that actually run our institutions and by extension, in turn, run our individual lives. So in Drop the I Word, for example, we made an, we made a, an argument that the use of the I Word to refer to immigrants was used in a discriminatory manner. It was never used against European immigrants and uh, always used, uh, 90% of the time used against Latino immigrants and the other 10% used against other immigrants of color and other communities of color. And we additionally argued that it was inaccurate as a word, that it did not in fact um, present a precise understanding of what someone's immigration status actually was. So conserv- immigration conservatives had really set the dominant frame on immigration by making that word ubiquitous, and their dominant frame was law and order. They argued that immigration had only a law and order dimension. It had no other dimensions, no survival dimension or family dimension or work dimension or human rights dimension. And by contrast, our frame on the issue was a human dignity frame. Whether we were speaking to uh, other immigrants or politicians or journalists, we said things like, no one deserves to have a word thrown at them uh, as a weapon of discrimination, and no one deserves to be misrepresented in the press. And then the narratives on the conservative side were always about law-breaking, whereas our narratives were always about people who had been harmed by bias. Now, our goal was not to generate a debate in which we're constantly asking who's the racist, but rather to ask the question, what is causing racial inequity? And uh, in, in the case of drop the I word, how is our language and the policies we've developed around that language causing racial inequity by narrowing the immigration debate in uh, so severely that we can't talk about real solutions in that debate. My second tip is to uh, rely so heavily on storytelling that you actually end up stepping away from the data. Now, I run something called the Applied Research Center, and there's no question that data is absolutely critical. But we can really over-rely on data and expect it to do the work that we actually need stories to do. And stories are the ways, are, are the tool through which we are going to recharacterize people of color, and they are the tool by which we're going to get Americans to think differently about what they would do if, to develop a 
new set of moral compasses and um, a new set of moral values, frankly, that guide them. So our stories were often about uh, undocumented immigrants and their experience of the word. There, We ran a great set of stories uh, on our website about high school students in Charlotte who experienced the use of the I-word as a bullying tool, bullying on the schoolyard, and then began to uh, do a campaign to ask all of their local outlets, the Fox News outlet, the local independent paper, the Alternative Weekly, as well as their uh, local daily, the Charlotte Observer, to drop the I-word. We ran a video by a nine-year-old who made a video for his fourth grade social studies class about how the I word strikes him and why it was wrong. In our own storytelling, one of the things we want to be careful about is not just casting the person of color in the victim role, but making sure that people of color get to be agents of change and agents of their own lives in those stories as well. My third tip, uh, like Alan's, just to reinforce Alan's, is to emphasize solutions. So in Drop the I Word, many, many, many people told us when we started that campaign, you are not going to be able to get the Associated Press to take it out of its style book. You won't be able to get polish it, politicians to, top, to stop using it. It is what um, it has become so ubiquitous that no one really thinks about it anymore. And yet we knew that if if all of the people who are currently active in immigrant rights could not use it, then we could certainly get other people not to use it as well. And so the dominant frame was all uh, the dominant message uh, around the I word was always there's nothing else to use that is the only correct word. Whereas our message was there are plenty of great alternatives, pick one of them and use it. And simultaneously with our campaign, immigrant artists and activists, uh, we didn't push the word undocumented as the only other word to use, but those artists and activists in their uh, projects like Undocunation and Undocumented and Awkward, which was a video series about, a very funny video series about how awkward it is to come out as undocumented when you're on a date, say, or when you've passed the California bar and now need to be licensed to practice law there, but you don't have papers, uh, things like that. Those kinds of projects really popularized the word undocumented and made it familiar. And so after two and a half years of campaigning in April of this year, the Associated Press dropped the phrase illegal immigrant from its uh, style book within a month after that. The LA Times had done it, as well as the San Francisco Chronicle, USA Today, the Denver Post, the Chicago Tribune, etc. On any given day, half of the world's people sees an Associated Press story. And um, among the other outlets, some 10 million people uh, are constitute the readership of those other outlets. So the impact of of that campaign and of that policy fight really affects, in the end, we're talking about billions of people. Now, I want to close by just noting that this kind of uh, communication strategy that changes the frames and narratives and messages on a particular issue really starts with the organizational or institutional comfort with racial equity as a concept and with the analysis, with the kind of data and uh, research and analysis that is in the All In Nation book. And that if your organization is not comfortable with that kind of analysis, it's going to be really difficult for you to carry out a communication strategy that moves it forward. And yet there are enormous benefits. Uh, so if you're, if you're feeling nervous about it or feeling afraid to, to do it, to be explicit about race, um, there are many wonderful examples across the country. One of my 
favorites uh, comes out of the Restaurant Opportunity Centers United, which engages restaurant consumers in fighting the racial segregation and gender segregation that is so prevalent in high-end restaurants, which is where the living wage jobs in the restaurant industry are. Um, you can find out lots more about that at their website at uh, rockunited.org. Uh, in education, the Schott Foundation for Public Education has started the Opportunity to Learn campaign. That, that language of the opportunity gap rather than the achievement gap is a reframe that puts the responsibility for racial disparities in education firmly on the institutions rather than solely on the students, which is what achievement gap language does not do. I will... Um, one of the tools that we've developed at the Applied Research Center is the Racial Equity Impact Analysis Toolkit, which can help organizations and institutions analyze the rules. Um, I will send out the link to that toolkit in the chat function of this webinar. In Minneapolis, a set of organizations has just successfully gotten the Minneapolis School Board to agree to use that uh, racial equity impact analysis when it is making new decisions about how it's going to run Minneapolis schools. And in November, we are going to be releasing a paper about successful race reframes in the press that um, will outline some of the common damaging narratives on uh, racial narratives and present great ex current examples of successful reframes. So I would encourage people to be on the lookout for the Racial Equity Impact Analysis Toolkit as well as for that race reframing uh, paper that we'll be releasing in November. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rinku. That was fabulous. And um, I see that we have lots of questions, and we not a lot of time, so I want to get to one of them right away. But I do hope that some of you have heard the answers to your questions um, in some of the comments that were made um, after you wrote them. But I want to start with one, uh, Alan and Rinku, um, and I think I will go first to Alan with this one because it relates to uh, talking about uh, climate change, health disparities, economic process, uh, sorry, uh, economic progress, all of which are talked about uh, to, to one degree or another in All in Nation, but one that we don't often focus a, a lot of attention uh, on as an issue area we want to discuss, as we do with housing and immigration reform and other things. So, Alan, do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> sorry, but what exactly is the question? The question is, how do we, how, given all that you've talked about in terms of framing, messaging, values, um, how do we talk about the, the, the issues of climate change in communities of color? Uh, uh, in a, okay? Yes, I got it. So uh, a few things. I think one is to understand the kind of values at play uh, around those multiple issues and recognize that they're issues that most people, most persuadables at least, don't put together. So I think, you know, the stewardship of the earth, which is a really important value, is, uh, you know, key to kind of the environmentalist base, um, but often, you know, for some reason not applied uh, when it comes to communities of color. Uh, that's an important value, but the, the climate change piece is a reminder that we're all in it together. So it's that community value and the idea that, uh, you know, if we don't pay attention to how everyone is being treated, how everyone is affected, it's actually going to uh, be to all of our detriment. So I think in, in addition to understanding the values, the other piece I would say is really being clear about causes and solutions, systemic causes and solutions, uh, and recognizing that you're going to have to balance on the one hand, this is about all of us. On the other hand, we need to be responsive to the needs and circumstances of different communities and be smart uh, about how we solve, uh, address the problem in, in each of those contexts. I'm being a little vague because I'm not, I, I, I'm not entirely sure what specific um, situation the, the question is coming from, but I think those, those same kind of principles of kind of identifying the values at stake that we share with our audiences, 
being specific about uh, not just disparate outcomes, but uh, disparate structures and disparate opportunities, and then being uh, as specific as possible about uh, solutions and action. Uh, and, you know, the spectrum, right, from here's something that everyone can do, you know, the kind of change a light bulb would be the, you know, uh, use a low uh, voltage, uh, low watt light bulb would be an example, to the really systemic policy solutions that we all need to uh, push our, our elected officials towards. Um, so I, hopefully that, that gets at the core of the question, but uh, if, if um, you know, the, the questioner should feel free to follow up with more details, and I, I'd be happy to, to delve a little deeper. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add is that um, every issue has a racial dimension, including this one, and that um, organizations that are working on climate change um, need to develop the sophistication to be able to address that racial dimension. So uh, one possibility, for example, is to take a look at the concept of uh, climate refugees, people who have been forced to migrate because because of um, environmental destruction and, you know, that plays out in their home communities. That, um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a sort of um, creates a visual image, that frame, that, that might be good. And I think it's important in climate change work to elevate the storyteller of color, you know, to, to enable um, some of the the great spokespeople who have experienced um, the, the devastation of climate change who are of color all around the world and, and in the United States, too, um, to get their voices and faces and images into that debate. Thank you both for, for those, those responses. Um, I have another question uh, that... A listener wanted to know what percentage of the time do do we think people actually we're successful in actually getting people to change their minds and uh, Alan Renku, think about how you might want to respond to that and I want to I want to add something to this and say that at PolicyLink we've recently developed a tool that we call Gear Getting Equity Act Action. Getting to Equity Advocacy Results, GEAR, is the, is the acronym, and it's available on our website. And while it isn't something that, that will provide specifically the answer for you um, uh, and to the person who wrote the question, but it is something that helps you think about the, uh, an advocacy process, um, the, the steps that you take in organizing and communicating and doing research and so forth. And so it might be a tool that you want to take a look at because one of the things we find is that very often when people are engaged in a campaign, they're very focused on the outcome. And when the outcome isn't the desired one, we fail to look at all the things along the way that we did well and that we need to sustain because we will have another opportunity to go for that desired outcome. So I would, I would urge you to go to the Policy Link website and look at GEAR, G-E-A-R, and see if that might be helpful in thinking through um, the work that you may be doing on changing opinions. Um, and Alan and Renku, do you want to add anything on, about changing opinions and, or have any tools or thoughts on how you measure the success? Sure. Well, I, I can start. I mean, I think the, my first thought is um, the answer is always going to depend on strategy, audience, and purpose. By that, I mean, you know, are you trying to mobilize your ones and twos? You're not changing their mind. You're actually trying to get them to take action. Are you, are you trying to persuade your threes and fours? Sometimes with fives, you know, with people who are, are against you, you're not trying to convince them. You're speaking truth to power. Sometimes that has to be done, and it's important. It's not designed to necessarily to persuade, but rather to, to say, to speak the truth when it needs to be spoken and, and to say what needs to be said. Um, you know, the other thing I would note is that we do have uh, uh, more and more examples of significant changes in public opinion that 
you know, where there was a long laying of groundwork, and then the change has happened pretty quickly. Uh, you know, the death penalty would be an example where there was no progress for a very long time. There was a change in strategy to focus on innocence and the arbitrary nature of the death penalty, and then there was significant progress over the course of, you know, about five or six years with lots of states abandoning the death penalty and, and public opinion moving in a, a helpful direction, though we, we still have a long way to go. Uh, LGBT equality is an obvious example. Uh, immigration, a pathway to, to citizenship, and particularly a, a, a roadmap for the dreamers. I think those are all examples where, w as movements, we spend a lot of time laying the groundwork, working to reframe the debate, uh, and you know, monitoring circumstances on the ground. And then we saw what and when it comes to public opinion, was very rapid and monumental change that is allowing a lot of positive things to happen on, on the policy sphere and in the way people treat each other. Yeah, I I don't think I I know the answer to this question. Um, what percentage of time are we successful? I do know that how I measure success, besides the kind of opinion polling that um, Alan is talking about, is by action and by impact. And I also know that people change their minds for different reasons, for a whole variety of reasons. On drop the I word, for example, uh, one of the things that happened after the 2012 election, but before before the Associated Press made their change is that Republicans began weighing in saying that they were going to drop the I word. And their their motivation clearly was about capturing Latino voters, um, whether or not they actually really find the I word dehumanizing or or went through a soul searching process where they thought, oh, I shouldn't use that word anymore because it's um, it's we only use it in this racist way. I I just have no idea, but it doesn't matter when the National Hispanic Conference, which is a conservative Latino group, and Rand Paul um, came out on the record saying, "I we shouldn't use that word anymore. Um, that was good enough for me. So measuring by action and impact is... Um, is another critical set of uh, evaluation markers for people changing their minds. Thank you, Renku. Uh, we're just about out of time. I want to give uh, Renku an opportunity to respond to this last question. Um, and it has to do, because it's so uh, rooted in storytelling, and it's also a question that communications folks d talk about a lot, um, and that is, how do we tell stories and work to reframe the narrative without lifting up stories as exceptions to the rule? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. Um, I think um, you have to tell the same story multiple times from different angles. So... Um, so if you have, you know, the example of one public school, let's say, that does a great job getting its kids to high literacy levels and to graduation, you don't want to do a story that is just about that one school. You want to talk about other schools um, that are there. And if you really only have one example, then you want to um, build into your storytelling the uh, characters who want to bring those innovations to their schools also, or um, or you want to build a frame that's big enough to house different kinds of examples, different kinds of solution examples. So the way to not isolate um solutions which might not be widely used yet is to group them together either with exactly the same solution and people who are using it or with similar solutions. Um, you can go across issue here and say here's a version of that solution in the restaurant industry, here it is in public schools, here it is in healthcare. But um, avoiding isolating those solutions and uh, really talking about how they could become ubiquitous, that would be my take. Thank you, Renku, and thank you to everyone for participating today. We um, ha have had a really good conversation, really good presentations. As we have noted, um, we will be sending out the PowerPoint 
we, all of the PowerPoints. We will be also sending you a link to All In Nation, but just to remind you again, it is www dot all in nation that's one word all in nation dot org uh, and we hope you'll go there download the book uh, participate in more webinars and you we will keep you on the list to send you out information about those um, and also if you don't know that we we're also going to be releasing a poll uh, 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 on this same topic and we will be doing that in, uh, in in about a week and so we will keep you posted on on what's going on with that. If you have any questions, you should feel free to contact uh, Sarah Truhaft, who is at PolicyLink, Vanessa Cardenas, who you heard on this webinar and who's at the Center for American Progress, or to me or any of the presenters. You have our emails, and we look forward to keeping the conversation going and communicating the all-in nation. Thank you so much. The all-in nation. Thank you so much. The All In Nation. Thank you so much. The All In Nation. Thank you so much.